Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Gino Johnson, CEO of Champions for Veterans, and I am so excited for today's episode of Convos with Heroes. We have a very special guest on with us in David Jones. He's got a great, phenomenal story, and he's really doing amazing things for the veteran community. So I'm really excited to share his story. But of course, uh, I want to say hey to my dad first. Hey, dad, how you doing? I'm doing great, Sean. I'm excited to be here with a phenomenal American hero, David Jones. So can't wait to hear what he has to say. Yes, sir. Same here. Same here. So, man, before to, to, without further ado, I want to go ahead and, and read David's intro and, and just a little give you guys a little bit of background on him before he, he shares his information. Uh, but, you know, David Jones, he's a 23 year U.S. Air Force retired vet. He served 1976 to 2000. He retired as a senior master sergeant. He served 16 years as a flight simulator technician slash supervisor and seven years as a data analyst supervisor slash superintendent. He earned his AS electronic technology degree through the Community College of the Air Force and AS production management BS industrial engineering technology through Southern Illinois University at Carbondale while in the military. Then after retirement and working full time, earned an MS of business in project management with certifications in business management, change agent, and a project management through Colorado Technical University in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Wow. Very well educated man we have here today. Uh, after retirement from the Air Force, David worked as an operations manager for a national company for two years before the company restructured. He then became a contract employee working to maintain flight simulators for Lockheed Martin, LBNB Associates Inc., and CAE at DY Dias AFB in Abilene, Texas, before mm -hmm. retiring in 2015 after a contract change. While working at Fort Worth Joint Reserve Base, David and his wife joined Lighthouse Fellowship, UMC, and were on the core team, which established Lighthouse Leadership Program and training courses before moving to Abilene, Texas. He then moved back to the Fort Worth area in December of 2015 and returned to LFUMC and attended the Veterans Initiative Program that kicked off the beginning of Veterans Freedom Retreat Organization. He and his wife, Linda, became uh, a, participant, a participant coordinators for VFR after attending the National Veterans Wellness and Healing Center in Angel Fire, New Mexico. Colonel Chuck Howe began the NVWHC in 2009 when he realized the VA was not treating the spouse of veterans with PTSD. So he developed a program with professionals and veterans to build the program to helping veterans and their partners to find freedom from PTSD. In October 2016, VFR had its first retreat and had conducted 10 retreats since, uh, serving over 117 participants with an average of 60 plus percent reduction of PTSD stress levels. They do this through a week-long course using experiential education, counseling with LPCs, along with various alternative modalities like massage, acupuncture, Reiki, various types of art, craft, Native American ceremonies, and equine supported communication uh, training. Equine or equine. I don't, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, David, but you, you can- Equine. Equine. Okay, perfect. So David is uh, the VFR program director and participant coordinator and continues to seek out sources to gather our veterans diagnosed with PTSD to have the opportunity to attend one of their VFR retreats. Wow, man, David, so honored <laughs> to have you on with us today. I mean, you're doing amazing things for the veteran community. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, but of course, you know, as we do with Convos with Heroes, Tell us, who, tell us who David Jones is. Let, let the world know who you are. Tell us your story. Well, I'm just a old boy that grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, my dad was a World War II veteran in the Navy. In fact, he joined the Navy after hearing about Pearl, Pearl Harbor. And many of his and my mom's classmates were killed during that, that uh, attack. And so he, uh, he, him and my wife, uh, I mean, his, uh, my mom got married and he went off to Great Lakes, uh, got, went into the, the Navy ba uh, basic and then went to Great Lakes to be a signalman. That's the one that does the flags and all the other stuff and everything. And so he uh, did two tours in the Pacific and one, on an LST and an LSM. 
those are the smallest seagoing vessels in the Navy that also would hit the beachheads. And uh, so if you see, saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, those were one of the ships uh, in that. And uh, he hit the, a lot of the islands out there, the Gilbert Islands, Tarawa and, and all like that was ready to hit the mainland of Japan just before the end of the, the war. And I had the, the, the great pleasure of 21 years after, I mean, of 51 years after the war to meet his shipmates. And wow. even Pepper, they had a reunion uh, up at uh, uh, Nashville, Indiana, a little hotel place. And so we went up there and I got to meet with them and hear them tell stories about my dad. Wow. And and one of the stories that they told that my dad never talked about any of that stuff, as, as we all know, we don't want to bring that stuff home and infect the family, as you might say. But they told, uh, I met the medic that saved my dad's life when he had appendicitis in the ocean and he, that he was transferred from ship to ship to go have the operation and stuff and that was a miracle in itself at that time because of the they didn't have the technology we have today but then they told me about when they were going into Tarawa that my dad was uh standing up or high up so he could be seen giving the signals and they knew that there was a sniper on sh on shore shooting at him and they tried to get him down he said I can't get down I gotta finish my signal gotta finish my signal you know, we do mission first. And so when he finished and he got down, they were patting him down and everything, seeing if he had any, any bullet holes in him. Not a single bullet hit him. Wow. Wow. But there was holes in his flags. Wow. Incredible, man. Yeah. That's stuff, and, that's stuff from and, a movie that day. Wow. Wow. Yes. And, uh, but anyway, they, they finished up. And uh, he said that when they went to, they were all preparing to hit the mainland of Japan and they knew how heavily fortified it was and they were just scared to death because just thinking of how many people, how many lives would be lost. And before they even, before midnight, they got notified that the war was over. Of course, oh, wow. Tokyo Rose, you know, getting out the information and they had to verify all the signals and make sure everything was good. And when it was confirmed that it was true that the war was over, well, needless to say, there was so much celebration with explosions in the air from the, the weapons that they had celebrating the, the fact that the war was over and they just could not believe it. But they came back and uh, went to, uh, dad was uh, dropped off in San Diego. And then my, his skipper told me that, that uh, they were going over back to Norfolk, to take the ship to Norfolk, because my dad was released from the military. And uh, so they went to go through the Panama Canal and they asked if they had any stores on board, and they said, yeah. We said, well, sorry, we can't let you through. No weapons, um, no explosives can go through the Panama Canal, and our warehouses are full on the Pacific side. So the Whoa, whole, I know what that means. <laughs> you can't get in. You got, yeah, you got to go around the horn if you want to get on that side. And so uh, they went out. They shut off all the explosives. <laughs> So we'll, well, we'll just go through. So they went back to go through and asked them if they had any stores on board. They said, no. I said, okay. I figured, well, we'll just get them on the other side. Well, when they went through the canal, they went to go get munitions on the uh, Gulf side. All their warehouses was empty. Because <laughs> <laughs> all the other ships that went through, they left it on the Pacific side. So those warehouses are full. But it right. took to get the stores over to the Gulf side. And so 
The skipper said, well, guys, you ever been to Haiti? No, let's go. So they started doing island hopping. And if you'll remember, the Navy lost a ship for a period of time. They could not find it. And so what was happening was the skipper was Allen hopping around. And one day, uh, a newspaper reporter called up Norfolk and asked them if they were still missing a ship. And they said, yes. Well, we know where it is. They're down here at this location. Needless to say, the Admiral sent a ship down, a destroyer down to collect that ship. And so they were fixing to go to another island and uh, they were told to heave to. And uh, they said that the uh, Admiral wanted them back up at Norfolk. Okay, we'll be right there. No, we're escorting you. <laughs> So, no. well, guys, I guess we're not going over to, to uh, Puerto Rico. So, so yeah. they off and they were, uh, uh, when the destroyer came in, they were all lined up on with uh, Navy Whites. And, of course, those on that ship, which was a war, you know, they were all straggled with their war clothes and stuff like that. It was kind of like, it seems like that was the beginning of, uh, of that uh, story with the uh, I can't remember what show it was about the uh, real the Navy had the ship. It was a funny comedy movie, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, they were haphazard and they were standing up there in their cutoffs and yeah, <laughs> and they wow, saluting and everything. Yeah. That was my so dad's me, ship. Yeah, let me ask you a question. That's a great <laughs> story. So fast forward, fast mm -hmm. forward to you join the military. And make mm -hmm. a determination because it's fascinating to me that your dad, I mean, as such an American hero, yeah. uh, World War II, no doubt, man. Uh, the flag story with bullets in the flag was just incredible. I got choked up listening to that. That was incredible. But uh, fast forward to, yeah, yeah, man, that was great, great, man. True story, phenomenal. Yes. Fast forward to you making a, a determination not to go in the Navy but to go in the Air Force, and then you get in the Air Force. Tell us, get to that part. Well, I was the only son of five kids. You know? Okay. And uh, my dad told me not to go in the military. And uh, I even had my draft card and all this other kind of stuff. And, and uh, so then one day it came down that I was uh, selected. I had a draft number. And when my dad found out about it, he went down there and told him that I was the only son and I was not going to go into the military. Wow. <laughs> so I got reclassified and uh, wow, everything. So then uh, I, after I graduated from high school, uh, which that is a story in itself, because it took me three years to get out of the seventh grade because I had an attitude. My dad had PTS. And so uh, we didn't see eye to eye. And so, but anyway, when I did graduate uh, and received my diploma, I walked it the stage. I was married three months prior. So when I got my report card, I was uh, married and working after school. So I signed my own report card and turned it back in. The teacher got upset and said, why? I'm married. I'm living up on my own. What you want me to do? Go take it home to my mommy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, she didn't like that. But anyway, uh, but I did uh, different jobs and I worked for about five years in the civilian life doing different things. And uh, then I even worked with the uh, city and got a certification in wastewater treatment uh, and got that certification before my six months in the job. And they could not uh, believe, because when I took the test, I thought I was uh, not very educated and stuff, but I did the best I could. When I took the exam at uh, uh, University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa one weekend, I took the test with a hangover because Alabama lost the ball game that Saturday night. And, uh, 
was taking the test. I just asked the Lord to help me through this thing. <laughs> so, but uh, when I got the results, out of over 300 people that were taking the exam for that certification, the Lord blessed me would be in number five. Wow. Wow. Now, at that time, you were living in Montgomery, Alabama? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so when I got back, that all my people in my in the city was excited about it because there was two guys with college degrees that did not pass the test. <clears throat> so, oh. uh, yeah, and they were required to. Right. So I was promised a job. So then when the next promotion came up, I was looking forward to it. I didn't get it. They gave it to somebody that had been there for 15 years, never took the test, didn't need a test, do the day gum job, and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, oh. Okay, so because of what had happened with me getting that high score, I figured, okay, I could, uh, me and another guy could take the uh, graveyard shifts of other people and then get some college. Well, that wasn't going to happen. I'm like, okay, I need to get some college. Here I am, 24 years old, and the cutoff was 25 to go into the military. And uh, so I went down and I talked to the recruiters. My dad said, don't go in the Navy because of his thing. I knew I did not want the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew what the Marines did, but I wanted education. So I looked to the Air Force, and I knew I wanted to do electronics. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know all the terminology in electronics, right. but I signed up, and they said yes. So they gave me a guaranteed job in electronics. So what year was this, David? What year was this? This was in uh, 76, 1976. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was right at the end of the Vietnam era. And I went to late enlistment for uh, five months. So in December of 76, I entered mm -hmm. training and went to Lackland Air Force Base. And about the fourth week through basic training, my drill instructor came in and told me that I needed to go and pick another career field. Mm. And uh, not qualified for that one because the career field I had chosen was in electronics, but it was a top secret clearance. My wonderful boss back in Alabama was upset with me because I did a letter of resignation and I told all the things that was going on wrong that nobody else had the guts to tell them about that needed to be corrected. And even the superintendent called me up one day, chewing me out, calling me all kinds of names about what I had, wanted me to rewrite it because I was going in the military. I said, well, the reason I'm going in the military is because of all the bad stuff that y'all are doing and won't, and won't uh, uh, take care of your people. And so I'm telling the truth about why I am leaving. If you want me to reword it, being that uh, all this stuff, I will also include <clears throat> dates and amounts of raw sewage that went to the river that you did. Whoa! And everything, and not only report it to the city manager, like I did with this letter, but I'll also send a copy of it to the EPA. Of course, he called me an SOB and all this other kind of stuff and everything, and he hung up. Said he'd make sure that I didn't work in that field again. Well, remember, I was working at a ship plant. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I wanted electronics. And so anyway, I went to pick square fields and nothing really popped out at me, but I saw these other two that was flight simulation. I said, hey, that sounds cool. That means with airplanes and stuff. And uh, it was electronics. And there was a digital flight simulation and an analog flight simulation. Well, I knew mm -hmm. that numbers, right? But analog flight simulation was two weeks longer. Well, I wanted the education. So I picked that one. Well, when I went to the tech school up at uh, Rantoul, Illinois, up at Shoot, uh, Chinoot Air Force Base, that's when I learned the difference. Digital was the up-to-date 
ones and zeros and stuff like that. Analog was the vacuum tube simulation, the old, old technology. Mm -hmm. program, you actually had to calculate all the amplification and stuff like that and rewire it. Yeah. And wow. do it with the soft program. Well, guess what? I got to go to Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, on the East Coast, and work with the F-106 flight simulator. Mm. And uh, loved it. I even got to fly some of, in some of the target airplanes when I made uh, Airman of the Month or Airman of the Quarter and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was in the target airplane. Wow. Being, being attacked on simulated uh, yeah. Yeah. with uh, F-106s. Wow. So let's jump forward a little bit. Let's jump there. forward a little bit. That's phenomenal. So you get there, you get to school. Yeah. Uh, talk us through your military career because I want to get to the veteran thing that you're doing now. Okay. So walk us through some of the things you did and, and where you went overseas and then we'll jump to your retirement. Go ahead. All right. Then I went to, uh, I was blessed by getting the different uh, Amber Month and then got made uh, Buck Sergeant uh, all these below the zone, and because uh, one of the things is so, so let, let me make this civilian your best. I gotta make this civilian proof. I understand everything you're saying, but my son doesn't. All this okay. below the zone, <laughs> Buck Sergeant. Let me explain something. When you get promoted for the civilians that are watching this video, basically what David is saying, when you join the military, they say, Okay, you you need 36 months and just an example, I'm, don't take me right. verbatim, but I'm going to give you an example. They may say you need 36 months total time in service to be a sergeant, okay? Yes. And if you make sergeant before 36 months, you're making it below the zone. So that means you're on mm -hmm. fast track, you're getting promoted faster. Mm -hmm. So I saw my son looking at like a hog looking at a wristwatch. <laughs> Buck Sergeant. I'm like, hey, hold on, let me civilianize this because the there you go. won't know what this is. So you're on, you're on a fast track. You're getting promoted fast. You're making it on. A, I need to know something, though. And I hear you. Very smart guy. Everybody can tell that. But no one makes it to the top, David, by themselves. No. I need to know some mentors that mentored you. Uh, we got your dad, but I'm talking about why you were in the service. Can you To, but give us a couple of stories of people that gave you advice and mentored you to help you along the way. When I got to Langley, there was a senior master sergeant that was in charge. Mm -hmm. Chop. And below him was a tech so technical sergeant. Uh, that's a, is that an E6? And uh, so he, he uh, both of those were very very knowledgeable in the uh, electronics field and, and taught me and kind of encouraged me. They also encouraged me to learn about the Air Force history, things like that, which is what they tested us on for getting, uh, going up for the Airman of the Corps, mm -hmm. doing these things. And so they really uh, encouraged me to do that. So as I got those awards and stuff, it was due to their mentorship. And then uh, in, at three and a half years in total time in service, I was promoted to a staff sergeant. E6 or E5? So, E5. Okay. And Army's uh, different. Army's different. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, gotcha. But it, yeah, E5 in three and a half years. Wow. That's unheard fantastic. of. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'll also give that to. Lord above, uh, but so then I was reassigned uh, and went to Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and I was selected for that position to establish a brand new simulator shop. From wow. and so I had to get all the technical orders and the, for that aircraft and everything that simulator, get all that stuff built up, and and one of the things that my recruiter told me. I could go do any job in the military that I wanted, except for administration. Hmm. And so admin, I could do the mechanical stuff, I could do electronic stuff and everything like that, but not admin. And that was the 
biggest part of getting it established, but it was at Davis Mountain Air Force Base and I got it all done there. Uh, and a few years later, I was, uh, uh, re I got my base of preference because I was at my six year point. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Hold on, David. I got to put a pin in this, man, because people don't understand. I, I I understand everything you're saying, okay. but but I got to make sure I break this down for people. Uh, you're talking about a young airman, basically just making staff sergeant, three and a half mm -hmm. years, and given a job to get multi millions of dollars worth of equipment. Yes, and then put all this stuff together so they can train people that fly multi-million dollar jets yes and so i want to break this down so people really as you're as you're explaining this i get it the task is huge you would probably this would probably be we're talking civilian this will probably be given to some executives to do i in the civilian world it had at least a master's degree minimum and 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 i understood financing and everything else mm -hmm. but this is given to a staff sergeant with under four years in the Air Force, and he's got to figure this out. This is one right. of the reasons I always tell people, the people that I've met in the military, and I'm not just saying it because I'm retired, I'm a lifer and talking to another lifer. Uh, I've met brilliant people like you. I'm talking about my whole career, that you look at these guys and you say, does that guy have a college degree? No, that dude's just, he's just brilliant at what he does. Where well, they were medics, mechanics, mm -hmm. they could do communications. They were just brilliant at their job. And you're a primary example of that because I'm blown away by that task alone because I understand the difficulty of pulling all that together, especially as a young airman. Uh, it, it, man, that's just phenomenal. So, so, so you get that going. You did that. Move on. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about you later in your career because mm -hmm. what rank did you retire as? Retired as senior master sergeant. It's E what? Explain it to me. E8. E8. All right. Same as me. Senior Master E8. With 20, what? how many years you had in when you 23 retired? 23 years. 23 years. Now, let's talk about this part because I'm going to jump from uh, retirement into civilian life. Uh, and if you're anything like me, David, what I found out about myself, you know, I went in the Army at 17. I retired at 37. But what I found out was... Uh, I was still kind of in the army in my mind. I never quite made it to, right. to, to civilian world. That's why I've only had one civilian job. I've been <laughs> retired 22 years this year. And, and I literally worked for one major company for two years. And, and uh, my wife tried to warn me, said, baby, this ain't like the military. And the right. first, my first week as a man, two weeks as a manager, uh, they told me a job had to be done. So I had my crew working overtime and I thought we did a great job. And I came in the next day and I got a phone call from the boss and I got chewed out. Ranger, mm -hmm. why are you doing having these people go overtime? Well, sir, you said it needs to be done. I had them work a few extra hours that night. You're not authorized to have people working overtime. <laughs> well, was the mission to, to get everything done or not? So anyway. Talk about the jump, man, mentally, everything from being a lifer. Now, I'm looking straight at you because if you tell me it was the easiest thing you ever done, I may have to come, come out to Fort Worth and get you. <laughs> what was the jump like from 22 years in air and 23 years in the Air Force to being a civilian? Tell me about that, that jump. Well, the latter part of that career, I, I had to change careers. Okay. I went from flight simulation, then I went and used my college degree that I got through uh, Southern Illinois University and became a data analyst and went to Charleston Air Force Base. And when I got there, they just received a brand new C-17 aircraft. Yeah. That's the big brand new one that a lot of times you see on TV that the, uh, they jump out of on a lot of these shows on TV. And my commander, uh, found out my degree and he put me in charge of the warranty program over $25 million program of a brand new aircraft because really? of my degree. And so as an analyst, uh, I did special studies on problems affecting the uh, efficiency and how they could use the airplanes. 
And within the two year, two and a half years that I did that job, uh, I submitted over a hundred engineering redesigns to McDonnell Douglas to improve the airplane. And every one of them was in, admitted and implemented on the aircraft to make it the effective airplane that it is today. McDonnell Douglas wanted to hire me. I got orders over to South Korea. And while I was over there, the company changed from McDonnell Douglas to Boeing company. So when I came back, I no longer had those contacts. Right. I was looking at going with them for retirement. Never saw them. But anyway, um, but when I got, when I did retire, what ended up going to uh, Tyndall Air Force Base, Panama City, Florida, mm -hmm. another four and a half years. And uh, I got promoted to Senior Master Sergeant E8 after changing career fields, which they said that it would, I would not get promoted. They didn't know my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, of sure. the things that did there and also what uh, was accomplished in, in South Korea. But when I did retire and moved to Iowa Park, I applied for a, a civilian job and uh, with a national company that I found mm -hmm. out and they wanted to hire me. And I was going to the little church there in Iowa Park and I asked them if I could delay my start time with the company so that I could go on a mission trip because all those times in the military, I couldn't do things like that. Right. So I wanted to do a mission trip before I started with the company. So I would be gone for a week and then come back. And so we went down to, uh, to Mexico along the uh, border to Terra, Terra Nueva to build a, a, a house, cinder block house for a family there, came back. That was an amazing job. I recommend everybody at least go on a mission trip of some kind to another country and see what, how they live. Make sure you help appreciate this more. Well, I started working as an operations manager for a national company. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like you say, when you're given a job, a task in the military, you do it to your best of your ability and you do it as quickly as you can and get it done. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I took over that position and I was uh, at that time in charge of 10 road warriors. Road warrior is the company would go and have a client in different places all across the United States, helping schools to improve their energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. And so we had people that were experts in different areas of that field. Well, my job was to disperse them to reach uh, 10 clients a week. That was two a day. You fly out on a Monday, you fly back home on a Friday. Mm. Well, you got to allow for the fly time too. So trying to adjust all these things was a challenge. But I was doing that and everything. Right. So two years later, they wanted to restructure. And on April Fool's Day, they called me into the office and said, uh, uh, boss wants to see you. Oh, well, actually, the CEO told me, uh, I want to see you in my office here in a little bit. I'll let you know. Yes, sir. I went back to my office and was doing some work, and I got the call. So I went in there. And there was the CFO. Uh, the financial officer was there, the number two man, sitting there with the with the boss man that started the company and said that they wanted uh, me to submit my resignation in lieu of termination. Hmm. I said, uh, okay, this is Whoa. April Fool's Day. Is this a joke? No, it's no joke. I want you to... Uh, collect all your things, but I want you to train your supervisor on your job, on how to do your job and do all that and everything and uh, show him how to do it. Then pack up your stuff and leave and uh, at lunchtime and, and then bring me your letter of resignation. It, oh, and we're having a company luncheon, but you're not invited. So go and do your, your thing there. Went, okay. 
So I showed my boss how to do my job. He couldn't understand what in the heck I was doing with all that stuff. Cause at that time now I had 17 road warriors all across the United States. And I had managed it even through 9-11 when they were trapped and all kinds of stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. following orders, yes, sir. And uh, so I did my stuff. I collected my stuff in a, uh, a case, a cardboard case of paper. And I took it out to the car and went home, told my wife what was going on. And uh, I did my letter of resignation exactly and worded it just like they said in lieu of termination. That was their mistake. Because they were looking at getting out of doing unemployment for me because I resigned. But with that verbiage of in lieu of termination that they stated, I ended up nine months on unemployment because I could not find a job anywhere else at that time. Mm. And that was in uh, 2000, 2003. Wow. In, wow. In April of 2003. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I started my own business. Wow. <laughs> you know? Good deal. And I and when I went back and dropped off my letter of resignation, I told them that my wife told me that she and my pastor were praying that God would take that job away from me. Hmm. They are an answer to my wife and my pastor's prayers. Yeah. I wanted to thank them. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they, I thank them they for gave me an opportunity to fly. Huh? They gave so, me to fly, man. And so anyway, I, I told them that uh, thank you so much because now I get to spend more time with my grandkids and my family instead of working for you for 65 to 70 hours a week yeah. just, to, just to do what you would ask me to do. And the reason they said that I was being terminated, not only for reorganization, was because I overstepped my level of authority, just like what you stated. Wow. Taking care of business. Yeah, I get it. So let's let's fast forward to the ministry. I know you're involved in ministry, and I know you do a lot of yep. stuff with veterans. Talk about that piece, because what I believe a lot of veterans will see this, and many of us deal with PTSD. Uh, yep. we, we, we're, uh, what I always tell vets, stop lying. We lie. You know, how you doing? Great. Fine. What's going on? Everything's awesome. And we're jacked up and we lie about it. And I said, we, cause I put myself in that. Uh, I'm not talking about people. I'm saying I, I do the same thing, right. Uh, out of fear of not wanting to show we, I'm a human being, you know, I'm retired green beret mm -hmm. and, I'm tough as woodpecker lips and nothing bothers me and just drive on. And that's what, you know, we see on the outside, but on the inside, we're crying and we're hurting because we're mm -hmm. thinking about people we lost, it, family relations issues. Right. First of all, man, tell me, uh, tell us exactly what does your organization do and break it down so I'll understand the mission. What, what do you do? The mission of our program is same as in uh, National Veterans Wellness and Healing Center in Angel Fire, New Mexico, that was started by Colonel Chuck Howe, <clears throat> is to help helping veterans and their partner experience the freedom grip of PTS. That's it. We do it with the veteran and their partner. If you're only doing the veteran, if you're only treating the veteran and their their symptoms and their their troubles and issues, you're only doing part of the problem. Right. Because everybody that lives in a household with a veteran with PTS, PTSD, whatever you want to call it, we don't we drop the D because that's a disorder. That means you can't do a daggum thing about it. Yes, you can. We call it a syndrome because that can be made better. You can do better. And so we, we teach them all kinds of things we provide. And by the way, I want to state the VA does 
the best that they know how to do. Right. And their, their, uh, uh, their mission is to help the veteran. I don't fault them on that. And they try to do that. But they're also limited with different things from Congress and everything like that on how they do stuff. But we do not report to the VA or to any other entity on anyone that comes through our program. When you come to our program, you go, you use our, our counselors, licensed professional counselors, and the other things that we do, any reports that are made, they maintain that in a locked file and nobody gets to see it. Now, let me say something on that because you know what we do is help veterans get their VA benefits. And I want to make sure I want to break this down for other veterans that are watching this. We've all heard stories about veterans losing benefits, right? And, right. Including PTSD benefits. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've heard, I've talked to veterans. So basically, what David is saying is you go there, their organization are there to help you. Uh, nothing is sent to anybody outside of that group. It's solely to help you. And so this is phenomenal because every week we hear about different people going. And it can be as simple as a veteran goes to the VA with PTSD. He sits down with a VA doctor and the doctor says, David, how are you doing today, sir? Doc, I'm doing wonderful. <laughs> Doctor may say no. I'm telling you what I know, folks. Right. Doctor may say no in a VA chart. David Jones with PTSD came in today and stated he is doing wonderful. That's right. And next thing you know, you get dropped from 70% PTSD to 30%. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and, and the veteran doesn't know that's happening. You're just making a conversation with your VA doctor. You're not saying... Doc, I'm doing great. I no longer have PTSD. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, this mm -hmm. is the kind of stuff. So I'm glad David is, is really stating this and making it clear what they do and what they don't do. So vets will understand this is a safe place. Go, go ahead, David. We do, uh, if the veteran is looking with uh, helping or uh, going through a program like yours and they need some information that we may have from the counselor, on different situations. We have had veterans to request that information. They have to request it and there's particular uh, stuff to do that. And then we get with the counselors that provide, that was their counselor mm -hmm. to provide that backup information. Right, right. And so we don't do it ourselves. Right. We go to the professional that provided that that support and then they communicate with the veteran and the entity that's trying to get it, whether it be either a lawyer or whomever. And so they work that out. We don't yeah. get that. We, yeah. you know, we yeah. respect the veteran and their partner and all those issues. And so, we are let, I, well, let me, let me put straight a, on that. Yeah, let me make sure I state this too because I think this is valuable information for veterans to understand. Basically, what David's saying is sometimes if you're going to, well, all the time when you're filing for VA benefits, we mm -hmm. recommend right. you have med medical evidence, okay? No matter what you're filing for, PTSD, back pain, so on and so forth. So if a veteran goes through their program and the veteran states, you know what? I'm going to file for PTSD. I'm having issues. Uh, it's service connected. That veteran can can communicate with David, their organization, and get their counselor and get their documentation from them and submit that as part of their paperwork to the VA. Uh, yes. That's kind of what you're saying, right? Yes, yes. And so we have, and, and because of that, going the proper way, mm -hmm. has valuable information. To oh, absolutely, absolutely. Case. So and talk so, about the but, course, man. Talk about the program. Say I come with my, my oh, wife. Man. Just tell me, walk me through just how to, I mean, what, okay, Ranger Johnson, well, I want to come. I got issues. What's going on? How do I get in that program? Well, usually that comes through my uh, email portal on info, on getting information about the Veterans Freedom Retreat. And that comes directly to me and on an email 
where you say, I want to go. I'm interested in coming. So I, I return with an email and I give you a brief information on what we do, that we do experiential education. It's a seven and a half day retreat. Give so, me your website, David. Give your website so they can know how, like, how to get there. That is VFR for Veterans Freedom Retreat dot V-E-T, V-F-R dot vet. It was the whole long word and everything like that, but shoot, even me, it was hard for me to type that in if I wanted to go to the website. So we got it with uh, the dot vet, which is for veterans and for veterinarians. Mm -hmm. So for the dogs and it's for the guys, you know, so... <laughs> But uh, so we dropped it down to that and we trained or uh, changed our URL, URL to just the six letters. Got and it. So with that, you get into it. There's some information about our program. There's also some video testimonials of those that's gone through the program, them and their partners, about what the program has done for them and some other stats and different other things. And then there's a place called Get Started. Because if you want to get started, then it'll open up with an application. Mm -hmm. We've had over the years, we've had to adjust and modify for different liabilities. And so that application is 13 pages, but two of them is what's called a PCL5. PCL5 is basically 20 questions on PTS that you answer. Whatever you mark down there, it doesn't matter to me what you put. I'm going to show it to the counselor, and they're going to evaluate how best they can help you. So you need to be totally honest. to yourself. Awesome. If you're not honest with yourself, then how do you expect people to believe anything else you say? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay? Wow. So you got to be honest with yourself. Yeah. If you're not honest with yourself, you're not going to get the help that you need. That's awesome. So That's give awesome. us a story as we get ready to wrap up. My son, say something. Go ahead, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was actually just going to ask that. But before we kind of get into the story, I want I want to hear like a, a testimonial from you. Just a portion of to tell the name. Tell us a good story <laughs> of somebody who you've helped. But before you kind of get into that, I want to, I want to also kind of hear, you know, being a numbers person, it's like the numbers are good to hear. I know in, in your intro there, back in 2016, you guys had 117 uh, people uh, mm -hmm. go through the participants in the program about how many have you had ever since then in total and this what's that 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 well, percentage decrease in the well with all the COVID and everything we were shut down okay? yeah and so we just had a uh, retreat number 10 was in November of 21 mm. and the last two got shut down uh, not only for the variant but also the place where we're using uh, got sold. Mm. So that, then we had to find another location, which will let you know that we now have a new date, a new location, and uh, it's going to be April 26 through May the 3rd. Okay. It's going to be a Tuesday through a Tuesday. And it's going to be in Iowa Park area, a place called Camp Chaparral. It's a Baptist camp that they uh, do. And we have worked it out with them that we're looking at uh, being there April 26th through May 3rd. Mm -hmm. And bringing our program in there, real good facility. And so, but uh, with that, we have... We have used, uh, yeah, I think still at uh, 117 participants. Right. Finished that up in November. And um, we have had nine people that came with a suicide plan mm. because they just couldn't take the PTS anymore. And this was their last hope. And with, the, with their counselor, they instead changed it to a life plan. Nine people almost wow. per retreat. Wow. 
Man, that's incredible. You talk about life changing, life saving, Pete, saving. You know, I mean, it's that's incredible, brother. A lot what of people blessing. come because this is their last chance because they've tried everything else. Mm. And it, yeah. And uh, even though we hope it'll be held at a Baptist camp, we do not state that we are a Christian organization. Mm-hmm. We, I'm a, I'm a believer, and yeah. what God has done with me. But one of the things when I was in the military, we all were given a handle of some kind. A handle is just a nickname. I, I was a master sergeant in South Korea when I received my handle from my truck troops. And uh, I'm proud of it because what they had, uh, gave me was dad. Yeah. That's awesome. I made sure that I took care of my troops, not only my troops, but anyone at my base when they would go out on a Friday or a Saturday night to a town to go do their partying and stuff like that, I'd hang back, I'd work with them, I'd, I'd party with them too. But I'd make sure that every single one of them got on the bus to get back to the base. And on the last bus, I would be on there making sure everybody got there. And then when the people got off, especially the, the females, I would escort them to their dorm to make sure they were safe. And sometimes I'd even have to knock on the door to make sure that they locked the door. Right. And everything. And I wouldn't leave. I'd make sure that they were done. And that's why mm. they put me the handle. Man, but that's, com- that's compassion. I make sure that my people are taken care of. When you apply for information, about our organization, you become one of my people. Mm. And mm. I'm going to give you the information truthfully, honestly, and going to try to help you and uh, and everything and give you all that information. I have uh, even had one guy that went off the radar and he started ignoring my texts and my emails, even though he came through the program. And uh, he wouldn't do it. I said, don't make me come down there and get you. He didn't answer. A few days later, I was parked in his driveway. He came walking up, and he saw. as soon as he saw who it was, he started smiling. I got out of the truck, gave him a big hug and everything, and uh, said, I told you. I'd be here. He could not believe that I drove over three hours, three and a half hours to get to his house out in the boonies in Texas to check on him. Yeah. You don't talk to me. How am I going to know how you're at? My mind's going to think the worst. Yeah. And so I don't leave anybody behind. So I came Mm. here to get you. Yeah. Yeah. And he just could not believe that. Yeah. And it, it turned it that helped turn him around. And the thing is, nobody, nobody should go through the thoughts of suicide and things like that. There's always somebody there. Mm. If not, give me a call. Yeah. A better freedom retreat and uh reach out and mm. i will get you there mm. now the retreat on the application you get that in we've had a lot of people that would sign up but then mm. wouldn't show up yeah that cost us a whole bunch of money yeah it costs you and your partner zero dollars but it cost us four to five thousand dollars you know, I can I can hear your passion, David, because you know I I mean I I want to get this and let my son get to the final question. Um, man, this is just a tremendous interview. Thank you for doing this. Um, 
even the story about driving three hours, three and a half hours to check on a veteran. You know, I, I think when I retired, I always tell people, you know, 20 years in the military, when I retired, I didn't miss the stupid stuff I did. You missed the relationships and the connections. You missed the camaraderie. You know, yes. I never once sit and went, wow, I like, like to lay back on a pine tree or walk through, <laughs> walk, walk through the swamps of Savannah, Georgia, freezing. I never wanted to do that again. I mean, I did it when I was in the Ranger Battalion, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I never think about, wow, that was wonderful. No, what you, what you think about are the time you spend with people like, you know, David Jones and the jokes and, and hanging out together. And then when you retire or you get out of the military, you kind of separate it. You're right. off to yourself. Yep. And, and when the mind can be right, and you can get to some places you don't need to go to. And it yep. sounds like what you guys do, you you reconnect that family together mm -hmm. and, and the husband and wife or whatever with their partner, and you give them another mission, and now they, they kind of together. So, man, let me say this as I kick it to my son for the final question. Thank you so much. And I'm going to throw my son to, to yeah. get your final question here. Awesome. Yeah. So, David, sorry, like you want to say something? Yeah, we, uh, we use all different modalities to help people because we go through the education to help you understand what PTS does to your brain mm, yeah. and to your body and to your fellow relationships in your family. Yeah. And we are helping to build, rebuild relationships. Mm. You know, mm. sometimes we get that stinking thinking in our mental, military head and we just charge through and we don't even think about the other. We say, what the heck, you know, that's the way I am. Deal with it or whatever. Well, guess what? We have three questions that we ask. Okay. When you wake up, are you the person that you want to be? Mm. who are you going to show up as today who are you going to be today mm. okay do you have the relationship that you want to have mm. and the third question are you living the life you want to live wow if any if a no to either of those three questions is no, you got work to do. Mm -hmm. And so we give you the tools to improve your life and your relationship and your living, as well as how to, when you get the trigger, you can de-stress mm -hmm. right now. Right. All of us that went into the military were taught tactical breathing. When you're at the range, you breathe in, you hold it, and squeeze off the round, then you release. When you get triggered, five rounds, okay, of this exercise, breathe in for three seconds, hold it for four seconds, and expel all you got in five seconds. Wow. You do that five times. Why is that important? When you're in the survival brain and you've got triggered, you're thinking fight or flight. You start breathing and doing the counting. When you start counting, you can't stay in the survival brain. You got to get into yeah. the executive brain. Yep. Okay. So you do that counting, you do that breathing, and you do it for five repetitions. You have also reoxygenated your blood going to your brain mm. so to think clearer. Right. You can think clearer. Now you can make better decisions. Wow. Woo! That's it. Woo! David. That's some of the things that we teach. Wow. When we tell them that you're not breathing. Well, yeah, I am. I'm alive, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. That's, That's wow. Military way. Well, I'm breathing, so I must be. Yeah. What is you breathe in the way you think about it. Okay. And then other things. There's other exercises. Tapping. 
and things like that that you can do. You know, a lot of people stroke their beard or this or that. Mm -hmm. Stress, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rubbing your temples when you got mm -hmm. a headache takes the stresses away. There's all kinds of things. We have yeah. between 60 and 70 tools, non-medication that you learn and you get to try them at the retreat as for which one works for you. Right, right. Okay, and then you take that with you by having your partner there. And for those that don't have a partner, let me say this. What we say partner is spouse, family member, significant other, mm -hmm. or battle buddy. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a family anymore because of PTS has broken those relationships, you still got a battle buddy that you knew. Right. Got a right. connection with already. Bring that person along. They can come too, no charge, even though they don't have PTS. Wow. Okay. Wow. And, uh, and so that way you have somebody that when you get triggered and you're having your worst day, they can also remind you of the tools that worked for you. Mm -hmm. The retreat. Like, Hey, remember one of those things that they had was that breathing thing or that tapping or whatever. And it gets you back to your, stable state wow awesome thank you david thank you david i mean that's just you guys are equipping people or equipping veterans and their families to really just you know uh yeah to readjust yes have, have, have a lot more peace in their household so thank you for what you guys are doing at vfr um you know like my dad mentioned we have one final question and you, you know you're really doing some amazing stuff you guys are really making an impact on the world <laughs> You know, the question we always like to end the interview with is, you know, when you're, when you're gone, what do you want to be remembered for? What kind of mark do you want to leave on this, on this world? That be remembered that I showed love mm -hmm. to my fellow man, right. their partners. To help them in times of trouble, mm -hmm. to go through life, and to be a better person. Wow. The questions that I, I mentioned. Mm. Remember those. Yes, sir. And think of dad. You might say that uh, I, I just I just encourage everyone. That if you're struggling with PTS, seek help from someone, even with you guys, with your program that you have as well, with us at VFR. And uh, if nothing else, hit with a battle, buddy. Yeah. And uh, don't go it alone. Right. When you went, through the, when you went in combat, you never went alone. You went as a team. Mm -hmm. Where's your team? Who's in your team? Build your team with those around you that can help you, that will care for you, and will support you. Mm -hmm. we, those of us right here are uh, with Gino Ranger and myself with VFR. We would love to be on your team. So come and join us. Wow. Woo! Thank you, man. David. Grand slam home run, David. Thank David you. Dad Jones. <laughs> By the way, one of our mutual friends, his little son calls me Papa Jones. Yes, sir. I got you. <laughs> so, I think that's the new handle, Papa Jones, brother, because, man, you moved to that dad, to that grandfather wisdom. And I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming. And I'm going to hit it my son, then he'll kick it back to me to finish it out. I, yeah. You done, sir? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Thanks again, David. Appreciate you being on here. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are going to be encouraged to love and to, to be that light in this world. Um, so uh, I pass it back over to my dad to finish it up.
All right, everybody, this is Ranger Johnson. You know how I got to finish this video. Convo with hero. We got a great American hero, a U.S. Air Force retired lifer vet, David Papa Jones. It just shared incredible information with us, and I, my heart is full. So this is Ranger Johnson telling you to stay in the fire.